Right, this is um, 26th of July, Sunday. Um, I've finished the conclusion of the video. Um, I just got a few corrections, a few additions, and a few events I forgot which I was going to put in. Um, uh, just this is where it's important to test um, scripture, the scripture, and not take anybody's word for what the scriptures, um, what the scriptures mean, um, and to test those who are authorised to to teach with the scriptures. You can't just take um, people's because uh, people have made mistakes. Uh, so you, you've got to test all things with scripture. So I meant I had a hypothesis about Judas that be, I, I, I mentioned in, I can't remember what part it was that I considered that he had um, he was a traumatized victim because uh, the Lord said uh, he had a devil. But um, afterwards I thought, well, he hung himself and he might he would have had a conscience so um, so he obviously knew what he was doing so and and the Lord said he you know he would only lose the only one that would be lost was the son of perdition which was Judas so I, I questioned my um, made me question my hypothesis my uh, impulsive hypothesis so I doubt I doubt it very much now so Perhaps he uh, he still could have gone through that kind of um, traumatic uh, Luciferian craft or the Babylonian breaking the ch child, and then so it becomes possessed, and then you you can control the uh, uh, the piece, and he he would have been a, perhaps he would have been a very important piece in his community to have control over when he was an adult. Which could be how he got caught up in with the temple uh, authorities. He had a relationship with them in some degree. Which scripture doesn't give a full picture of his activities. You can only you can only ponder and uh, go by the scriptures for the insights of what what's, what what we've been given to know and what we've been given not to know. So that was at that point I wanted to clear up. Um, I've got a few scriptures which I mentioned and I, I didn't quite and I just want to share what I was referring to. Um, Revelation, it's in Revela this is to do with the, the minds of people and the beast or the, the sorcery and power of the Antichrist spirit on the earth. But the particular scripture I was referring to the time when the beast in power but if you read the scriptures, um, the forces are on the earth and the, the apparatus, but he's not in full, full office, if you like. Um, chapter 13, Revelation, verse 4. Uh, this is what I was referring to, and then I'll explain. And they worshipped the dragon, Satan, and gave power unto the beast, that's the Antichrist, with, with, fully, with Satan fully in, like Jesus was the son of man in the flesh of a man he was uh, the son of God so he was fully God, fully man and this is the antithesis of uh, the dragon, fully Satan and he gave power unto the beast that's fully fully man, fully Satan in the flesh and he worshipped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? question mark who is able to make war of him? question mark so I was applying that heart and mind to people who, um, within the sorceries, because if we go to, that are always being um, activated in the world. Sorceries is the conjuration, the conjuring of power and forces to your gain. That's sorceries, bringing up spirits, stirring up um, controversies. It's all conjuring. It's all witchcraft. Uh, lying divisions, it's all of the devil. Um, Revelation 19, uh, let's go with, oh, 
I mentioned the book of Joel about the armies of the Lord saying I wasn't sure if it's the armies of um, heaven or it was the armies of Israel or it was both but if you go to Revelation uh, 14 and this is regarding when I was um, referring to the prophecy in the book of Joel um, and the Armageddon and the armies which were in heaven clothed with him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean so this is the Lord and his armies and if um, it's in verse 7 let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come so the Lamb is Jesus the groom all his house, all the people of Israel previous to the gospel are his party and he's married to the wife and his wife, it's the, the church have made herself ready and then and, and, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints so this is referring to a point in heaven just before the Lord's going to come down with his armies and that's that was a you can cross that reference out with Joel and many other scriptures many other books of prophecies so I wanted to conclude that uh, just go to uh, Revelation 18 uh, you need to read the whole chapter but uh, 23 and 24 and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee thy merchants were were the great men of the earth for by the, thy sorceries were all nations deceived so this is the sorceries by, that have been continuing on running up to the, the power of the Antichrist and all the, all the nations, leaders, nations given power well they have to because they're not going to have any choice and because the Lord has decreed and perhaps that's their judgement for um, supporting it so the, the beast is going to be given all the power but if you read Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18 it lays down the, the components like the, the, church, uh, the Catholic Church, the harlot the great, the, the great city which is Vatican City uh, the woman that thou sawest is, is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth um, <coughs> For all nations, uh, if you read on 18, for all nations have drunk of her wine and wrath of her fornication, and the king of the earth have committed fornication with her, the merchants of the earth, and wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And then all the plagues unfold through the sins. Uh, 18.23, and the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, the voice of the bridegroom, and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived and in there was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that was slain on the earth so there's the guilty co uh, culprit and if you do uh, research and history you can see all the associations and uh, connections uh, they may not be direct connections they may just be a consequence of them, uh, being party to one another so they may be ambiguous in their own beliefs but they may be united in their ignoring of the truth so they're all one component and um, you can see it throughout all the, all the sorceries are all Hollywood and uh, me the media um, I wanted to say something about the Twin Towers oh yeah this is to do um, I'll get on, moving on to my the two events, uh, two two car accidents that uh, one I never really considered until I had the other one, and then looking back on the other one, I thought oh, that was a setup. It just smack, it just smacked of a setup. And that the first one was around the time of the twin towers when the twin twin, twin towers were demolished, in the World Trade Center. Um, and that was actually I've got the footage it was re it, the script readers of the mainstream media announced that it had collapsed before it actually collapsed I think it was about by a minute and that's been that's been recorded and documented and shown in real time 
given the time on the on the news report and then measuring it with the time of the actual event it's like a minute out so that showed um, calculation that they you know it's scripted and planned and how did the World Trade Center just suddenly fall collapse to the floor like a deck chair it was that the shockwaves from the Twin Towers that, uh, and people just like ignore it perhaps they're too frightened to say anything because then you know because we're up against this um, satanic world that will do everything to bury over the the truth and it, all those standing around supporting it will join in or turn a blind eye because they're like um, supporting it and not speaking out against it standing up for the truth for the for the word so um during that time was when i uh, i was working at this care home when the twin i remember it it was um like everyone says you can remember where when where you were when kennedy was shot i've heard that so many times i was when the twin towers come down i was on a shift it was daytime lovely sunny day and it was on the news on the on the tv in the in the uh, residential communal communion part communal part in the living room in the lounge and i remember seeing it and uh, people sh everyone of course the shock of it i kind of thought well that's just the beginning of it and i said it i think i said it out loud like you know that's just the beginning I didn't know what I was talking about, but I, I, I believed the scriptures and I thought, oh, that's just the beginning of something. It, it just had the smack of um, fakeness, um, orchestration. So this, um, I was working on a shift and I, I think I'd done a whole night shift and then stayed to do a day shift and then I'd done an evening shift, which I shouldn't have done, but this is how these people would put on you because they were let down with staff and if, if you say yes you compromise yourself and anything goes wrong that you, you you take the fall you see if you stand up for them saying no, look no I need a rest it, it causes um, you know like a, an, an undercurrent which will come out some other way so I thought right I'll just get on and I was just going home in the evening, I think, about nine o'clock, my fish, my, my uh, shift finished. And I get a f my, my supervisor's gone home and, you know, been at home all the time. Uh, she rings me just before I'm leaving. Oh, you can pick Richard, you can take, you can drop Richard off to his weekend residence. He goes to, he, this is um, a, a very vulnerable uh, man who, learning disabilities and he, people looked after him over the weekend in a, and I had to drop him off in Farnham and uh, yeah, it's just people he stayed with and then I think they're to do with a craft club or something I can't remember but I had to drop him off at his res at the residence or at, at the place where the, the craft thing was where I'd drop him off and then he'd go home with the people for the weekend. Um, so I dropped him off. I was coming out of the, the town of Farn Farnham onto an auto the auto roundabout, turning left onto the hog's back. And this lorry was coming in the opposite direction signalling to turn left into the road I'd just pulled out of um, which was um, which joined the road I turned off from so he was coming round the roundabout um, clockwise passing my just coming towards my lane but he was signalling to turn off and he didn't and uh, uh, I had a bit of time to stop at the where the roundabout lane where you just enter onto the roundabout so I had to come to a stop because he he didn't turn left he swung into my path and as 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 I'd stopped and waiting for him to pass I could see this um, coming out of the town really fast probably about 50 miles an hour black a black Saab turbo was winding around the bend behind me 
and I could see how fast he was going and there's no way he couldn't have seen me and I thought he's going to hit me, he's not stopping and I can't go forward just yet because the lorry hasn't fully passed so what I did was just take my handbrake off, put it in neutral and dip my head down and relaxed with my with my arms between in, in my lap and I just slouched and, and just like tried not to think or worry about anything I just completely put it out of my mind cause, to relax and then he smacks me and I go flying into the across the road into the roundabout and uh, he hit my table so the impact that what the table was attached to to just absorb the impact it, there wasn't really any much body damage or crumpling to my car but his car was like completely his radiator was completely smashed there's an impact he, his car had crumpled on on the point he hit me so mine had a bit my car because he the wet way he impacted had a bit more resistance but his car didn't and it, cr it crumpled it and I was um, concerned for him and I went out to see him and he was like I'm sure he was on out of his face on coke and he was just like right oh, I and then he I said you're right mate yeah I'm fine I'm fine you're you're right yeah I'm fine and he just got off and drove off he said oh please don't tell anyone please don't tell anyone I got in and drove off I thought all oh, right <laughs> thanks and I was so tired and sick of I thought oh, I'm not going to report the accident. I'm just going to go into bed. But when I when I woke up in the morning, of course I had my spine, all my back of my pelvis. I was in agony, and I thought oh, I didn't have I didn't really have any whiplash, but um, it was just the back where I, where my back of my pelvis took the shunt, you know, the shock, and that was killing me. And then I put it out of my mind. I just got on with it, and. Uh, Then my second accident, now, I would, so that was about when the Twin Towers come down, I don't know how old I was, born in 1970. But several years later, um, 10 maybe, I can't remember how old I was. And uh, anyway, I was going, no, I, I just, this is my, I'll give you a quick, um, this may this may make a uh, bit of relevance, uh, but it's all of relevance to my life. Um, my mum, mum and her, my mum and my dad, one Christmas were going over to spend. Or it might be New Year, something like that. We're going over to her sister's who lived on a caravan park. Now, when I had the accident, I was visiting a neighbour of that caravan park who was a, a neighbour to my auntie and that's just, this is where I met her so I'm going to wind it back and um, and mum said oh could you pick and me, and me and your dad are having a drink could you pick us up oh, I thought oh, alright I'm turning up at the last please be ready I don't want to I don't want to get sucked into that way of life you know and all the all, all your sinful family and then they'd be getting you to, you know, wanting you to have a drink and whatever else is going around. And I turns up, and, and um, my mum's drunk, but my mum's a very was always a very sensible drinker, and she wouldn't overdo it. Never, I've never once seen her. Well, a few times she's let loose, but uh, to her regret, I think. And uh, so usually, ninety nine percent of the time, she'd hold back. My dad, on the other hand, was loose as a uh, um, a wild toilet roll being thrown. He would really let go with with alcohol. He was so easily encouraged, and he would just get over the top to my mum's embarrassment and shame. Um, and I was kind of half and half. I didn't like alcohol. Um, I liked um, drugs. And uh, I arrived, and they weren't ready. They weren't budging. 
So I've got to hang around. My mum goes, oh, I want to introduce you to someone. I thought, oh, it's this girl, this woman, um, a little older than me, smoking a massive joint, probably about, um, I don't know how long it was. I can't remember if I had a puff or not. I just wanted to get my mum and dad home and then go into bed. But I had to wait around. My mum's sister's ex-husband was there and my mum was like becoming really out of it and I thought my mum's been spiked. And I could tell by the countenance of this man that he had something to do with it and he and I think he had all a kind of it's the sort of thing he'd like to do. So my mum was completely smart after that and my mum hadn't had a joint but my auntie did and she was out of a nut and I thought, Are you really? and, I, and I spoke to my auntie and she said, um, oh, I don't know what's going on. I said you, you shouldn't have really she should this girl, I said I, I rebuked her publicly, I said you really shouldn't give people this stuff. Because she was growing this really strong weed. And I said, you really, you should keep it to yourself. It's like, you, it's like I've seen it so many times that people want everyone, because they do it, they want everyone else to do it. And that's something I, I always disagreed with. I didn't like to push it at other people just because I, just because I took of it. And I never put, uh, took it for uh, what other people would perhaps take it for, for pleasure. I'd take it because I was sick and, you know, um, trying to cover symptoms. So I resented drug dealers, I resented all the, all, all the way you treated, the whole monopoly of it and the way people treat you when you're dependent for it or you're after it. And this woman was growing it herself, but she uh, was, you know, sharing it at this party. And I said to my auntie, you know, you shouldn't, and I said to her, you shouldn't have given it to her, it's, it's dangerous. And uh, I had the impression my mum was spiked. And uh, anyway, I, I got to know this woman. So she, uh, she, she took me, she wanted to show me a grow setup. So while I was waiting for my mum, I sort of, uh, in, in, uh, uh, you know, just, when she said, oh, do you want to come over, I just, yeah, all right, let's have a look then. And I went over and had a look at her little setup. It was only a little light, one or two plants, nothing. She wouldn't go to drug dealers, and, and this is relevant, and I'll explain why, because I've become friends with her. She's a very nice girl, or woman. She's Scottish, and uh, she, Anyway, I took my mum and dad home, uh, mum and dad home, and then uh, well, I think I'd arrange to speak with her because she she kind of took a fancy to me thing, I think, and I took a liking to her, but she kind of cleaved onto me physically, and I kind of rebuffed her. And because I'm a Christian and I knew that she wasn't, I thought, well, I can't, I you know, I don't want no physical cleaving here. I wanted, I, but you know, to be a friend, no, no trouble. And she invited me round, so I went round. You know, shouldn't probably shouldn't have. And got to know her, and then I really, and she, uh, as I got to know her, she was from an ancestral family, and she was, and the reason she was living there because she's run away from her family. And she'd been abused and her family would deny it. And I don't think she re was really aware of everything, what had gone on at that time. And she may may have um, researched further and, and maybe made a link to do with organised paedophilia cults and covens. And so she could have been part of something bigger and her family were involved with it. And uh, she was in the middle of it and in the, the one that wasn't in the loop. So I started to realise I had that in common with this, this girl. And and I could talk to her about um, things, but I didn't, at this time, I didn't have any knowledge of my own trauma. So, but I had an interest in 
in people and what they were suffering because I was also suffering. So we had the sufferings in common, but I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't join what she knew with what what I'd experienced. But it was roughly the same thing. But I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know I was sexually abused. I didn't know I was traumatized by my granddad and broken. But I could see the same thing in her. You see, so we we kind of had that in common, and we we got on very well. And uh, a few years, like many years later, so this is uh, going back probably seven or eight, nine years maybe. I can't exactly remember because it's been so long. Uh, <coughs> this was a day of my accident. I thought um, I, I was having like a nervous, um, like a trauma. shockwave sort of thing, feeling, waking up feeling really nervous, shaking kind of thing, nerves right on the surface. I thought I'd go around and see Norma, see if I'm, yeah, I could do a joint. And I didn't, um, I shouldn't really have associated with her and I prayed, I looked, Lord, you know, please forgive me, uh, you know, please protect me. Uh, I just want to go around and see Norma, speak to her. I see if she's got any green, any leaves or something, or a bit of weed. And, uh, you know, the answer was no, stay, stay in. But I went round. And uh, this was after I'd left the Mormon church and I'd reported it. I spoke out against it, I'd reported it was illegal to uh, somebody I was, a uh, doctor, I was telling her about, you know, the, don't you realise the church lied to people? And they're involved in uh, private practices. You just laughed it off. I oh, don't be so silly. You know they don't. They wouldn't lie. I thought, oh, they're breaking the law. They're just taking advantage of vulnerable people. Doesn't that concern you, doctor? And she laughed it off. Um, so I was round, heading round to this um, caravan park. Now it's right opposite where my uncle worked and was working, I think, in his sort of retirement years, doing bits and pieces. But he was in hospital with um, cancer at that particular moment. And I arrived, and it's a, it's a real busy road, but there's a, a lot of room around the left sand. Where I was coming from uh, the left of the park and turning in right and to my left there's a big um, opening for lorries to pull into this depot so there's plenty of room to swing round into their lay-by when somebody's turning right so there's half of the road available but there's no curb it's just the the end flared entrance to the depot so lorries can turn around in this space it's massive so if you if you couldn't see anyone you could you could even if you'd done had to do a sharp turn, you've got plenty of time to get overtake the car and miss the grass verge when the when the entrance runs out. So there's plenty of room. There's, so how how this lady didn't see me and didn't avoid me because she just panicked, perhaps. But I was turning right on full lock, signalling. And I could see oncoming traffic coming. And they're like breaking the speed limit, so I think it's a 40 down there, and maybe a 30, but they're doing like 50, 60. And I'm waiting, waiting for a gap, and I can see this car coming behind me, a little green, I think it's a green Peugeot, uh, coupe, winding up the road really fast, fast as, as fast as this sort of sub, sub turbo coming. I can see it, the, my, the speed of it in my mirror how close it got so quickly. So I had my eye on it and I on I up the road and I thought, oh here we go. It's, this ain't gonna stop. And it just carried on going straight through me and I didn't and there was oncoming traffic so this time I couldn't relax. I couldn't do anything. So I thought what am I gonna do? I just like double minded at that point because I couldn't I didn't have any option. I was gonna be propelled into the middle of the road. 
because I was on full lock, so I was going to be whacked to, in, into the turning, and that's what happened. I missed the oncoming car; they stopped, and then the car then the car arrived behind her and stopped, and so that, there was only those witnesses. And uh, I was half across the road, so I pulled straight away after the impact, and uh, and. and and I relived really that for days after in slow motion, this imp impact. It was just like so fast and quick. Like someone hitting a golf ball with a full swing. It's just like. Pfft. Or. Like somebody kicking a dining room table really hard and all the. You know, and it kicks it under the. from underneath the, the stuff that's on it. And, and the stuff that's on it just drops on the floor. It's such an impact. And my chin hit my, my chair, it hit my chest, I whacked on my chest. I went, uh, the seatbelt almost broke my shoulder, where it goes across your shoulder. And I, I think I was catapulted upwards. And then the impact, the, the seatbelt pulled me back down into the, it, as I was going forward, my airbag didn't go off, so I wonder if it was my airbag tinkered with. Her airbag went off. Her car was written off as like a sandwich. You, you couldn't, you can't distinguish the wheel arches. The wheels were like mangled, and the bonnet was all crumpled. The radiator was smashed up, so the whole front compartment had done its job and and sandwiched like a crisp packet. But um, the back of my car had done the same, and uh, but mine, the police pulled the wheel arches away from the thing. But I pulled into the, the caravan car park where my, where my friend lived. And she, she wasn't home anyway. And I turned immediately, pulled in, left my car with the keys in it, unlocked, and just went straight to see if this lady was all right. And I wanted to move my car out of the road because I was, you know, Perhaps I shouldn't have done that. Perhaps I should have just got straight out of the car. But it it was literally a little distance. You could see my car from the side, so there's no, I had nothing. I sort of wasn't hiding anything. I just wanted to put my car off the road. I just didn't want to be in the middle of it, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, I went back to see this old lady, and I was quite angry because I I knew that she was speeding, or they were speeding, whoever it was. So I was going to give him a piece of my mind when I saw this old lady, you know, all slumped in her face in the airbag. I made I made sure her engine was off and and she was alright. I said, Are you alright? And she said, oh, I'm so sorry, I just don't know what happened. I didn't I didn't even see anything. I thought, oh that's a bit odd. What do you mean? And I didn't have time to quiz her. I, um, I didn't have a uh, I didn't. I didn't see you," she said. I, didn't, I, "I can't understand it," she said. Maybe it's her eyesight, and she had a reputation for speeding anyway. Because I heard from a, a neighbour, a friend of my mum's, who who was her neighbour, and she said, "Oh, she's a nutter. She's a, a loose cannon." So, anyway, up, following her was a, car, a police car waiting up the road. Um, about not very far, the next, where the, um, there's a little mini roundabout and they're turning into a house and estate. They were tucked in around there, nothing to do with the accident or, or not appearing to be. And they followed immediately behind this woman, directly followed her where the accident happened. Now, as this is happening, as the police are arriving, um, just before they arrive, Simultaneously, when I'm meeting this lady, the lady from who's watching from the gate at the depot comes over, and she says, "I phone, I phone the police, and they're on their way, and the ambulance." And she said, "Oh my, that's that's." She said something. Uh, oh my, um, colleagues, Eric. She she mentioned my uncle's name. Is in hospital. I thought that was odd. Why is she? With Mention. I never mentioned that my uncle was in hospital, and she mentioned it. And I thought, oh, that that's really not a coincidence. 
and then the police car that just arrived to the scene weren't the ones that, that were given the job they were separate and they pulled into the car park and they and while I was speaking to this lady and the ambulance arrived and I spoke and I was called into the ambulance what the police were doing were rifling my car uh, the doors were open, the boot was open, the ashtray was out, the ashtray was empty, there was nothing in it, I didn't smoke in it. And if there was anything in it, it would have been a, a cigarette, that had been a rolly that had been dubbed out, and, and it wouldn't have been smoking in the car, it would have just been put there to take out the car. Anyway, I, the ambulance driver had done all these questionnaires, and I was telling him, you know, how, a, a, you, you know, when you're uh, when you're pumped, when you're fight or flight, you're on cloud nine, I was on cloud nine, and, and I had all the symptoms, so I know what I'm talking about. I was uh, elated, and you know, come on, let's get on, kind of thing. I didn't feel anything, no injuries, I said, yeah, I'm fine. He'd done an assessment, like, and marked off that there was nothing wrong at all, all of it, all, all okay, all okay, and I didn't realise it, I didn't know this at the time, until hindsight, and I got the report. Um, then I, uh, the le then the, the an amp then he was on the side of the road then, on the verge. And then I, I thought I'd better go and lock my the car up, see what's, what, what damage is done to my car. And as I got there, this, this man and this woman, the man leading the woman, and um, he, was, he was dark and they were very sharp, thorny and cold. I said, oh, all right, what are, you, what are you doing with my car? Why are you rifling it? What, what do you think of my drug dealer? And I said, uh, he said, why did you pull off to the road? And it, it's none of his business. He weren't, he weren't, he weren't the one called the accident because the other police had arrived and they were invest, uh, investigating the accident because there's no skid marks. They didn't investigate anything. And they may have taken a witness statement of this other bent copper and he was a bent copper, rifling through my car. And I said, oi, ow, because she was in it. And I said, what, what, what reason have you got to be going through my car? And I was in shock. I, the adrenaline started to run off at this time, and I thought, oh, no, I can't drive home. And I was left there. And I went up to knock on my friend's door to see if I could recover there, but she wasn't in, so I had to go and sit in my car. And these police were waiting. They were just sitting, waiting over me. The old lady was taken off in the ambulance. These are the two police that, that mysteriously followed the lady behind, but they weren't nothing to do with the, people, the, the, the police that arrived. And, and, and as the main police arrived, a whole uh, minibus of police arrived from the other di direction, saw that the, the job had been taken, and they pulled up a good few uh, hundred metres up the road and pulled off the road and they were all sitting on the side watching see so the, the police that were called that got the call and took the job was nothing to do with the copper that was dealing with me it's completely separate and uh, so I don't know what authority this guy had he was nothing to do with the accident report but he could have been given false information to the people who were and it, I discovered on, on the uh, ambulance report now, so the ambulance driver would have asked this policeman the speed of the collision, and he was he wasn't there. And all the witness statements I gave, and I spoke to the pe person who witnessed. I said, "Was my indicator working?" Because I was a bit worried that she didn't see me indicator. Perhaps she didn't see me indicator. He said, "Yeah, it was working." And I took his, I took this person, at the time I took this person's name and address just in case. And then I wrote, I think I had to fill out a description of the accident, which I did. And drew it and explained exactly as I'm explaining it now. But I can't remember if it was with this policeman or the other policeman. And because uh, these, I discovered these rifling through my car and the boot up and... They just stopped and gave me the evil and he said, make sure you phone your insurance in. He said, that's the most important thing, phone your insurance. I thought, right. So I was under, you know, like they're trying to put me under pressure to phone the insurance. Oh, what, did you get a bung, dear? 
do you get uh, do you get um, some money for that? Do you? That's what I should have said. And then so I'm sitting in shock, and then the adrenaline's running off, and I I couldn't drive, and they're waiting behind me, you see, to pull out because they want to follow me. And all they did, I said, oh, I can't drive, and they said, oh, you'll be all right. And I said, you know, and I thought you these these were cold-hearted psychopaths. weren't weren't even worried. I I didn't get any treatment in the ambulance because it drove off with the old lady. And the, and, the, and the guy who assessed me said I was alright, I wasn't alright, I was, I was like, now I start to feel my neck, and my, my, my jaw, my shoulder, and my back, where my other back injury was, and I was in shock and traumatised, and then I was having a traumatic, and I was like, I couldn't function, I just couldn't, you know, shut down in my boots kind of thing, trying to pull myself together, come on, you can do it, you can get home, and, I, and it took me a long time to get the confidence to turn the key and, and these two coppers had been putting their foot on it yanking the wheel arches away from the car I was worried about the petrol tank oh no it'll be alright I was worried about the integrity of the steering and the braking and anything I didn't know how it would drive you see so not only did I have to go back out onto the main road in this car with them you know them waiting for me to make a mistake or something they weren't seeing me home because they were nice, they just wanted to, you know, sit behind me. And it, and, and when I did go, they, they pulled off. And then as I was driving home, I'm driving past these other places I had accidents where uh, this young girl careered across the road right in front of me, but uh, hit some parked cars and took all the impacts and she didn't hit me. So I was right, right across the barrel of where she crashed into the cars. And that triggered all that again. Then I had to drive past where this woman went through the windscreen, and I saw her face pop. And then, and then, then, then all the people in the other car that was like um, a jam buddy, and that all triggered it. So I'm going through all this re-traumatizing, re-traumatizing, and trying to get home safely. And then I get now I borrowed the horrible thing is I borrowed my dad's car. It was his car, I think. That's why I wasn't smoking in it, see. I smoked in my own car. My own car had that accident with that other car, which would, you know, I got rid of it. So I was out of the car. I never replaced the car since uh, I left that job. And I didn't have a car after that. That one. I got rid of that one. And uh, so I borrowed my dad's car. And my mum was having hospital appointments and she needed it for a hospital appointment but it couldn't be driven in the state it was. So as I got through the door it was all this pressure to get the insurance, get the insurance done. So my mum could have a, a vehicle and then um, we just went through our own insurance but then I can't, then I get in all these phone calls from the other driver's insurance pressuring me to you know, do this and do that, have them as their insurer. Then I was getting all these other phone calls. I, I, I must have had about six phone calls from insurance salespeople. And I just said, look, I'm not a piece of me. I've just had an accident, back off. And then the phone stopped ringing. And this was like a few hours after, while I was trying to fill out our insurance policy online, because it had to be done that night. My mum needed a car for her appointment. And she wouldn't have shut up until I, it was done she would have uh, you know skewered me with it it's all, all my fault and it was my fault so I was put, trying to put it right and I filled out all the insurance details for my dad got to the end of the online form oh before we can okay it you've got to give all your details to this third party that third party this third, and I thought oh another blooming pitfall taking advantage of people in their vulnerability and you got and you need this you got to accept it so I clicked it got my mum all sorted a hard car then I the next day I get all these letters backing up the phone conversations pressuring me into accepting their insurance and I, and I just like switched off from it what binned it get you know go away you vultures and um 
on the news that night it was a, the regulation where you can you could find this in the archives and it was the exact same evening as I was filling out on the computer I was watching the new, the news where my parents were in the in their living room and I was doing it on my mum's laptop and uh, the news report was oh we're clamming down on ambulance chases people who falsely you know go after whiplash and uh, we're making it harder for you know and it was a big news story and I thought oh, that's no coincidence so that means that if I go and go and now if I go and get try and get any help for a, an injury um, I'm going to get labelled with that well subsequently I, had, I couldn't remember the day off you know I was having short term memory blackouts every day every morning but it would eventually come back it would filter back up slowly and I and I couldn't drive after that I get in the car and I couldn't remember getting in the car so I lost my confidence and I just packed up and my license needed renewing so I thought right I'm not going to renew my license anymore I'm not going to drive I'm not going to be a bit of meat meat market merchandise lie to and that night I didn't re realise the seriousness once the adrenaline finally wore off I was like my neck was my larynx was um, my diaphragm had cracked all the gristle all the cartilage in my neck had shattered my head was like a balloon on a stick but I, I, what was keeping my head up was my my tension of my muscles because I was frightened of moving it I couldn't move it without uh, pain or discomfort or headaches all the front of my head was like numb like the bruising on my brain because in slow motion I saw my brain in my head you know the, the feeling of it you know you you're hit and you go forward at the speed you're hit in an instant like if it says 40 mile an hour you go 40 mile an hour 0 to 40 in a split second and, that, and then you stop and then your brain doesn't and then that's what that's what I was feeling all over my head and then I was uh, got weaker and weaker back problems so uh, I was literally bled, bed, bedridden for about two years trying to recover and I get and if I got out of bed I was just trying to sit up all day and sit still I had to sit still all day and hold my head up and then go out and then it took me a long time to recover I thought how am I going to get exercise so I, I, I had a, an, a late night exercise I'll go out when it's quiet because any traffic drive past me would tr my legs would give way because it was all on top of all the trauma I'd experienced and then uh, eventually I thought right I, I built I, over two years I think some things started to prove and all the chronic stuff remained so I, I thought well this is as far as it's going to this is the best as it's going to get I just have to live with it and then I keep forgetting that um, how injured I am and I do something stupid and it puts it all back to square one again in my neck and I have to uh, be still. So I don't know what the injury or how severe my neck is, I've never been examined. And every time I've sought to by the doctor they brush me off, uh, you know, it's just whiplash. And then when I did fight for an appointment I got a specialist, I applied for a specialist in head injury and neurology and, and neck injuries. I didn't get that, you know. I get a, so they spent the money and didn't provide me what I was applying the money for. And I get a physiotherapist who, who was a, a cow, and uh, you know, dominatrix. Or so she thought, you know, oh, I'll put this bloke in his place, a feminist, I think. You know, I'll put this guy in his place, and. Uh, when I did get to see that, this was like two or three years after going through my doctors who I went through once before and got nowhere and got brushed off and coldly treated as I did at that doctor's like I was a nuisance, a problem, go away it's just whiplash, don't waste our time, that's how I was treated and then when they refer to, oh I saw you, you'd have, I don't you remember seeing me with your car accident I said yeah I do remember you you obviously don't, or you're putting on a fake face, you know, all, all nice now. And so I saw this physiotherapist and they they said, oh, we can only give you six weeks physiotherapy. And this was before I, I was examined. I said, hang on a minute, I, 
you know, I've applied to see a, a specialist, have a proper examination to find out what the injury is. That's what I asked for. I want to see if there's any internal injuries, in my throat, in my neck. In case it's, uh, I, I could be paralysed by a gel or something, or or is my have I got internal bleeding in my brain? I'm getting all these headaches. Uh, you know, my doctor's like, oh, oh, you'll get that. Don't worry about it. I used to get a sharp bow in my a pain build up in my my head, and I used because because my family's got um, aneurysms. You see, my granddad had a strike. I think I was at a blood clot in my brain, and it's. Or is, is, have I got a, a vessel that it's having difficult? The blood's having difficulty passing through, and it's causing me this sharp, like like a bit of glass sticking in your head. And I tell my doctor that she goes, "Oh, we all get that. Don't worry about it. Stop wasting my time." And that's how I was treated all the time. Oh, could I could I, could I please have my um, blood type, please, doctor? Oh no, you don't want to worry about that. I haven't got time to do that today. You can't ask me another time, and out you go. And then you get people going in before you are uh, there for hours and hours and hours pouring all their problems out, pouring all their problems out. And you're waiting for three or four people to go in before you. And, and, and they don't get thrown out or they don't get told to hurry up. I go now, I'm not in there no more than a minute, no more than two minutes, at the most ten minutes. Oh, what is it you want? You know, that's how my mum was treated amongst all the other people getting all, you know, a different face. Uh, so I wanted to highlight that, and so um, all the gates are closed. It's all written up over you, it's like Micah Seven. It's all, it's all, it's all dusted and done and dusted. You know the what, what, whatever price the judges are offered, they, they, they wrap it up. It's wrapped up before you get any help. You know, in my life, anyway, I can't say that for everybody. You know, I don't, uh, I don't want to put fear into people who are going to hospital. Um, you know, there's lots of wonderful people in hospital. You just need, you need to go in faith and have, have the Lord with you and have, have people praying for you, and then the Lord will protect you. I, I was always protected in hospital, but you you come across this stuff, and when it's people of your loved ones who aren't, haven't got that protection, you you kind of get drawn into it. So that was the two accidents. Now. Because of the way it's treated, because of the way I've got all the evidence, I've got all the reports. Um, the insurance could be looked at and seen that both cars were written off, and you can't write cars off at 20 miles an hour. I can't. I think the airbag that will go off at that speed, but uh, or maybe a bit more. I'm not sure. But what they wrote is I had a little bump, and you know, there's no skid marks. Well, it wouldn't be with there because I didn't lock. I didn't have the brakes locked on. I put a touch of brake on uh, just to cushion the impact, but that made it worse. You see, I should have just done nothing like I did before, but because I was thinking ahead, I had more to think about in this equation, and I decided to just touch the brake a little bit. But that was a bad decision, and that just like increased my impact, I think. And then, and my vision was all blurred. Uh, my short term memory was shot to pieces and all my executive functions were worse than they were before so it's all buried under this mask and the lie you see and the trauma and then it drags up all the trauma and then no one's got any sympathy because they've not acknowledged it in the first place so you're continually buried in all these unresolved problems that's why people regurgitate and want to get their story out and you get, it's just a uh, until until you resolve it yourself, and then you can uh, stop being sick, kind of thing, and regurgitate it in a different light with, uh, for other people's benefit, rather than uh, churning in it yourself, because you're churning it, churning it, if you, if you're not careful. So that was it. That's that's. I think that's all the points I had to add. And uh, there's a little bit more to put on to the end of this, but I'm going to close now. Right, this is a final part, just some afterthoughts, final thoughts. Um, part seven, six parts. This is the last part, concluding part, of this um, very long uh, testimony 
account of my uh, satanic activity around my life pre-salvation and post-salvation and uh, all the various hands involved and components and my uh, thoughts and uh, evaluation and uh, bits of knowledge seen darkly to try and piece this uh, thing together to under for understanding and further enlightenment and so that's the, the, the final account that's the full account um, as much detail I could add and keep going over but that's the main drift of uh, main drift of the story um, I've just got a few thoughts I want to finish off um, and anything that comes to mind uh, uh, to do with any of the subjects I've already, already discovered, uh, dis discussed. Um, now, like I say, any, any, anyone watching this is, um, I'm posting this just for it, people's examination. It's uh, not something I desire to debate about. It's not something I did need to debate to debate about, and. Um, it's something I'm always re-evaluating, so I'm um, just offering it for it to be used to the Lord's glory and to help anybody and reach somebody or, or with um, further understanding or to um, share something with other people that maybe I have something they haven't considered. Um, now why not one of the things I'd like to include, I, I sort of, uh, well, two things actually. One is my, I want to be honest really about my um, personality pre uh, salvation and post salvation. And that nature is dual, dualistic in nature because I've got my parents, a mix of my parents' blood, and I've got that uh, split personality. And my dad's nature is predominant, but I've got that wild, sinning nature in me, which is more predominant on my mum's side. I, I, through my observations and and looking at the, both families, and I love both. You know, I've, I love my mum, love my dad, loved all my family. Um, I'm impartial, really. Um, I just wanted to give an honest account, but uh, my nature is, um, you know, I'm no saint. In, in uh, I was wicked and reprobate, and I had um, so one half of me desired to live righteously, but the wild side in me got the better of me. But I'm all that good side in me, with me always try to hold back the reins of that other side, just like the Lord's doing with me in my own life. I just couldn't do it on my own. Um, so I, you know, I'm like any other bloke with lust and adulterous eyes that wander. But in, in my heart, it's not something I, I, I could ever do physically. But like the Lord says, um, if you think it, you're guilty of it. You've opened the door to it. And so I can't deny that sinful nature in me, and, uh, appetites and uh, lusts of the flesh. I, I suffered with all these sins um, and I had big appetites in all many areas but it um, but these things broke me and made you know I just knew how wicked the world was I knew how wicked my own nature was and sometimes I um, come across all uh, perhaps holier than now but uh, I'm certainly not holier than now I'm just a sinner like everyone else. Um, now, one of the uh, experiences that really used to break my heart were when I worked in the field of uh, mental health or advocacy for people with mental health problems. And what I learned from the practice and the experts and the model and the downfall, the positive of the the good stuff uh, and the and the fallout on the bad side 
of uh, the mental health system and the private care bodies. Um, you can see good and bad in both of them. Uh, you can see the strengths and weaknesses in all, if, you, if you're honest. Uh, but I just want to, uh, one thing that really used to break my heart was um, bulimia and anorexia. Now these labels, bulimia, anorexia, and you wanted to grab these girls, these young women, and just like shake them or spin them, pick them up in your arms, shake or give them some love somehow, some esteem. But you can't, you, you can't break these um, inappropriate, you know, the inappropriate um, guide, you know, barriers anyway, and then the lawful barriers in practice, and sometimes they're not in agreement, but. Um, right is right and wrong is wrong. You can't be inappropriate, with, especially if you're a man. And uh, you always try, it's like homosexuality, you try and broach this subject and, and people defend it and um, cling to what they believe that they are. Oh, I'm bulimic, I'm a bulimic, I'm anorexic. And, uh, and I've not got a full understanding of all the terms and the the knowledge and and any truth within that psychology and treatment I'm not saying all the treatment doesn't have any truth in it and it's not beneficial for some people in all areas of mental health it's just the overall foundation and philosophy and the framework of it that I'm not I disagree with and I think the people that care in these systems are wasted and they're bound by misappropriated regulation and they're given misdiagnosis because they never uh, the on it my obs this is just my uh, novice opinion of what what the what 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 I saw and these are displays of symptoms of the social engineering that goes in the world I think if everybody knows that I think he looks at it honestly the bulimia anorexia are just a social engineer cultivated fallout of the sinful world we, we live in and these girls are stripped of their esteem and they develop these symptoms because they're the sickness of the world and the propagated media to feel inadequate or, or this is what you've got to aspire to be to be it's a van it's vanity mixed with or with the, all the supporting of that in the in the media and what these girls really need is uh, a bit of self-esteem and some love and some understanding. And uh, when you meet these girls in care, you can't, you can't, give, you can't, say, you can't give them Christ. You can't give them your testimony. And uh, you got to break through these barriers because they defend their labels and and they hold to their labels and they are they're putting their trust in their experts, in their um, doctors, and the people that they depend upon. And this is a trouble I spotted is that dependency on on these experts rather than and I, I'm not speaking about every individual some individuals are more acute and uh, sharp than others but some people are more dependable dependent and rely reliant on those that that are in, that they care that care for them but what they don't see is that care is superficial and it's not the carer that's given that care, it's regulated and it comes from a higher authority so people don't see that that fine line and these, uh, if you cleave to these labels, if you believe a lie you're held by that lie so I wanted to reach out with people, with anybody with that um, manifesting in their own homes and their, their, their loved ones of, these, of this um, illness or this symptom to give to give those understanding and anyone who suffers with this um, symptom of uh, sin and the the manifestations of the repercussions of holding on to those lies and letting those that uh, carrot and that that image of the world make you sick and then you start living out the your expression of that illness, making yourself sick, making yourself skinny, and then 
getting into such a state where you're you know in a terrible way and you're almost like skin and bones yeah, that's a very sad thing to experience and especially when you know the remedy is very simple but if that remedy is not accepted there's nothing anyone can do and these people are left prey to you know this uh, system to mop them up and that's all they've got but I wanted to cover that uh, bulimia I can't really um, I think I've covered so much areas I haven't really got anything more to add I got down as much as I possibly could um, and filled in all the uh, things I'd like, like wanted to add so without further ado that's the um, it's not conclusive but that's the uh, for now it's con the uh, chapters the parts the this this video is, is concluded and I'm going to close there just um, with a prayer um, I pray privately but um, I pray that it will be used for, to the Lord where, wherever he sees fit and it's to his glory and I'm going to close in the wonderful name and precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord Amen